Howard Giles Unger wrote a biography about Noah Webster, author of the first English dictionary in the United States. In his book, Mr. Unger focuses on Noah Webster's beliefs about language and its place in culture. The Institute for Research in English Acquisition and Development hosts this discussion with Mr. Unger, which lasts about 45 minutes. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, first uh, Reed Institute book luncheon. Uh, I'm, it is my pleasure uh, today to have uh, Mr. Harlow Giles Unger, um, who is the author of an excellent biography on Noah Webster. Uh, Mr. Unger, like uh, Mr. Webster is a graduate of Yale University. Uh, for 30 years, he's worked as a journalist, uh, uh, news editor for the New York Herald Tribune, uh, overseas news service, uh, as, and as a foreign correspondent for the Sunday Times of London. He's written six books on education, uh, covering all aspects of, of the education issue in the United States, and he's also the author of a three-volume encyclopedia of American education. Um, please join me in welcoming Mr. Unger. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, many Americans confuse Noah Webster with Daniel Webster. Daniel was a distant and much younger cousin, and he shared the same political philosophy as Noah Webster. The two men did know each other. Daniel was a U.S. Senator in the early 1830s, and he helped push through uh, sweeping federal copyright legislation that Noah had champion throughout his life. Both were great patriots, but Daniel's patriotism was always tied to his personal quest for political power. Noah Webster sought no power and got none. He tried only, in his own words, to do much good with little advantage to himself. The result was that except for his great dictionary, the nation he helped create all but forgot him, save for one in West Hartford, Connecticut, there are no monuments of him across America, and the Webster Avenues of the nation are named for Daniel and every other Webster except Noah. And that's why I wrote this book. I was astounded by how much the nation owes Noah Webster, and I was appalled that so many historians ignore him. Uh, the name of my book, as you can see, is Noah Webster, The Life and Times of an American Patriot, and what a patriot he was. Noah Webster was a towering figure in American history. He did far more than write a dictionary. As a young man, he marched to war with his father, brothers, and Yale classmates to fight for independence in the American Revolution. He wrote part of the American Constitution, to help, and he helped assure its ratification. He faced the street mobs who tried to overthrow the government of George Washington. He was the nation's first and one of its greatest social reformers. And while Hamilton, Jefferson, Burr, and Madison ripped the nation apart in their struggles for power, Noah Webster cried out, Union, Union, Union. Our dissensions must cease. There is no recourse but Union. And he gave the American people the cement to assure that Union. More than any other founding father, he created the very concept of America. Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, and the others were the fathers of political independence. Webster was the father of cultural independence. And without cultural independence, the nation would have fallen apart. It almost did. What many Americans forget is that independence from Britain did not produce a more perfect union. That came six years later. Independence didn't produce any union. It only produced a fragile confederation of 13 independent states, independent nations, really. They were at each other's throats from the moment they became independent. They fought over everything, trade, water rights, boundaries. They had their own armies. And they even went to war with each other. Pennsylvania's militia massacred Connecticut settlers who tried to move into northeastern Pennsylvania. And Connecticut sent Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain Boys to retaliate. The two states went to war with each other. The Confederation of American States started out as a league of friendship, but ended up a league of enemies. And making matters worse, each state had developed a distinctive culture and language. They spoke French in present-day Vermont, 
Gaelic and English in various parts of Massachusetts, Dutch along the Hudson River, Swedish in Delaware, English in New York City. No one could understand each other. In Pennsylvania, Benjamin Franklin complained that Germantown was engulfing Philadelphia. He warned that Pennsylvania, and these are his words, Pennsylvania will in a few years become a German colony. Instead of learning our language, we must learn theirs or live as in a foreign country. That's what Benjamin Franklin had to say about bilingualism and multiculturalism. Noah Webster was the first of the founding fathers to recognize the dangers to national unity of multilingualism and multiculturalism, and he was the first to do something about it. He saw those dangers firsthand in Newburgh, New York, where the American army had encamped at the end of the Revolutionary War just before demobilization. What he saw stunned him. He expected to see joy and celebration, fraternity and unity among a newly independent people. Instead, he found chaos and anarchy amid a cacophony of languages, mobs of different language groups, ethnic groups, and different regions of the country battling with each other. The scene reminded him of Babel, and he left the encampment with what he called gloomy forebodings about the nation's future. The disorder seemed an open invitation for British forces to sweep down from Canada and from, for the Spanish army to march northward from Florida. Webster recognized that political unity would be impossible without cultural unity. So he decided to find the source of producing that unity. He decided that the key to that unity lay in universal public education to give every child a common language and cultural heritage and to teach every child to alienate sectarian, regional, and foreign interests in favor of the greater national good. He developed a system of instruction that would teach every child to read, write, speak, and be American. The first result of that system was a little blue spelling book, perhaps the most amazing and most revolutionary book in the history of American education and certainly in the history of our nation. For it taught the children of those brawling illiterates that Webster encountered at Newburgh taught those kids to read, write, and speak one language and become one people, one nation, indivisible, as children now say, in the Pledge of Allegiance. For the next century, it would teach millions of Americans, from, uh, millions of immigrants from every nation of the world to do the same. What made Webster's little book so effective was the ease with which it taught illiterates to read, write, and speak, adults as well as children. There were other spelling books, of course, but they were ineffective. Webster's was remarkable, a century ahead of its time. He was a school teacher with great instincts. He instinctively developed phonetic spellings to make words look the way they sounded and make it easier for children to learn. In simplest terms, no one sits in the centra of the theatre. So he changed the RE endings to ER the O-U-R endings to O-R. He dropped the K's from music and public and made hundreds of other changes that turned the English language into the American language. And those changes made it easy for everyone to learn to read, write, spell, and speak. This little book, this powerful little book, introduced educational democracy to our nation. And from here, it spread to the rest of the world. Thomas Paine's Rights of Man did not start a revolution. Webster's little book started a revolution, for it was the first effective weapon against illiteracy. Universal literacy was unheard of anywhere in the world. For centuries, the church and state had depended on illiteracy to enslave whole peoples. Until Webster, education in America had been reserved for white boys of propertied families. But Webster believed that a free people cannot govern itself effectively or intelligently and remain free unless all are literate and well-educated. But the object of this book was not just universal literacy. An equally important part of Webster's design was the inclusion, for the first time in any school book, of stories and passages that had nothing to do with the Bible, nothing to do with England, nothing to do with Europe, and nothing to do with 
any religion. Every selection from the most elementary to the most complex had to do with the United States, with United States geography, United States history, and the U.S. form of government. Webster designed the book openly to indoctrinate every child with American values because he recognized that every language carries its cultural baggage. Children's readers from many countries indoctrinate them to obey unquestioningly the priest or those of higher social ranks or castes. Webster's American reader taught chil children to work and study hard, to become educated, to think independently. He taught them that legislators and executives were not masters but surrogates elected by the people not to, to rule but to do the people's will in day-to-day -day government administration. Over the next century, Webster's reader became a linguistic and cultural bond for more than 100 million children. Next to the Bible, it was the most widely read and most influential book in American history. It didn't become a bestseller overnight, of course. It was through sheer will and love of country that he made it a bestseller. He got on his horse and traveled to almost every town in every state, knocked on every church and schoolhouse door to convince every schoolmaster, every minister, and everyone who taught children that the safety and the na of the nation depended on using this book. He went to the nation's leaders, to the presidents of Yale and Harvard, the governors of Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, all of the states. He was only 25 years old at the time. And he went to Benjamin Franklin, to James Madison, to Jefferson. He even went to see Washington. I mean, this, this kid had guts. He was 25 years old. He got on his horse, rode to Mount Vernon, and had the chutzpah to knock on George Washington's door. He didn't know Washington, but he showed him a letter from the president of, of Yale and the Governor Trumbull of Connecticut, and then he showed Washington this book and began lecturing this great American hero on the need for cultural and linguistic unity to save the Confederation of States from an imminent breakup. Washington loved it. They got on so well. Washington invited Webster to spend the weekend. They became great friends. At one point, Webster even considered staying on to tutor Washington's stepchildren. And in the end, Washington, uh, Webster won over Washington and all of the other national leaders. All endorsed his book. All urged the nation's schools to use it to unite American children with a single language and culture. By the turn of the century, the schools did just that, and the United States became the first nation in the world, the first great nation in the world, to learn a single language, to speak a single language in every corner of the land, a century or more before other nations began to follow suit. To this day, language differences threaten to rip apart multilingual nations such as Canada. Jefferson Davis, of all people, uh, best summed up the impact of this little book. These are Davis's words. Above all other people, he said, we are one. And above all books which have united us in the bond of common language, I place the good old spelling book of Noah Webster. We have a unity of language no other people possesses, and we owe this unity, above all else, to Noah Webster's Yankee spelling book. Ironically, Davis uh, delivered those words in 1859, just before he led the South into a civil war. Uh, that war, unfortunately, claimed the only two Webster grandsons who bore his family name. They were brothers, and they died fighting on opposite sides in the Civil War. After the war, schools across the nation once again filled their shelves with Webster's books, which by then included his great dictionary. When he first published it, he called it the American Dictionary of the English Language. It contained many of the easy-to-use American spellings he had developed, along with a host of new words he invented, words such as appreciate, insubordination, expenditure, and subsidize. It was hailed as a masterwork and immediately became the nation's official dictionary in Congress, 
in each state legislature, in every courtroom, in every school and college. It even replaced Dr. Johnson's great dictionary in England. The presidents of both Cambridge and Oxford universities endorsed it. It became the official dictionary. It actually sold better in England than in America, and for a while the languages of the two nations were one, which was another of Webster's goals. Few English or Americans realize this, and there's a great story behind it, which is documented for the first time in my new book. As great and as important a work as it was, however, his dictionary ended up obscuring his many important achievements outside the fields of education and lexicography. Webster was far more than a teacher and far more than a scholar. He, his life was filled with adventure. Webster was one of America's great social reformers and public servants. In Hartford and New Haven, Connecticut, he pioneered universal public education, women's education, abolition of slavery. He invented unemployment insurance and workman's compensation, social welfare for the poor and homeless and for widows and orphans. He campaigned for free trade and commerce. He was a visionary. He was first to suggest building a canal across Cape Cod to get Connecticut goods to Boston markets. The uh, canal was eventually built in 1914, a century later, and uh, by that time it was already obsolete. Webster paved the streets of Hartford and inaugurated regular street cleaning to try to prevent the spread of epidemics. With Benjamin Rush, he pioneered public health. He was the author of the first demographic study of epidemic diseases, a massive two-volume effort that became a classic work in medical schools around the world. He was the father of American copyright laws. He founded two schools and was one of the founders of Amherst College in Massachusetts. He was one of the leading players behind the scenes at the Constitutional Convention and a major influence in winning its ratification by the states long before the uh, Federalist Papers were written, Webster had drawn up a constitution of his own called Sketches of American Policy. It came out two and a half years before Hamilton's Federalist Papers. Webster showed it to Washington, who in turn showed it to Madison. Every member of the Constitutional Convention had a copy of Webster's Sketches of American Policy by the time they got into Philadelphia to meet, and they incorporated several of Webster's amendments, almost verbatim, in the Constitution. This biography is the first to document uh, that influence, and it would be interesting to do a scholarly research uh, to examine it more carefully. After the Constitutional Convention, uh, Webster spent several years as a crusading newspaper and magazine editor. He exposed a foreign plot to overthrow the government of George Washington and he incurred the bitter enmity of Thomas Jefferson by exposing Jefferson's uh, political spoils system. So the story of Noah Webster's life is a tale of adventure and courage as well as scholarship. It is also one of the great love stories of early American history. His tenderness towards his beloved Rebecca and their eight children, his tenderness to all children, contrasts with the fury he often displayed in his public battles for justice. And it seems that every Webster undertake, public undertaking was a battle for justice, for the public good, for all whose legitimate human rights went unprotected. He believed his new nation had the potential to become a utopia, and he devoted his life to that end. In doing so, he earned the enmity of those who sought to divide the nation, but he earned the respect and devotion of those to, who sought to make us one, men like John Jay, George Washington, jo John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin. And he earned the love of millions of ordinary Americans whom he freed from the bondage of illiteracy by teaching them to read. Noah Webster's life was not about a dictionary. It was about creating a new nation, the United States of America. It was about making everyone in America an American. I think he best summed up his life with these simple words in his diary, a document he had no idea we'd be reading here publicly two centuries later. I have tried to do much good with little advantage to myself. My moral conduct stands fair with the world, and what is more, 
with my conscience. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have, although I think I can anticipate uh, uh, some of them with a simple no, Webster would not have approved of bilingual or multicultural education for uh, early elementary school children. Uh, Webster predicted two centuries ago that hundreds of millions of people around the world would one day speak English, that it would become the international language, as indeed it has, uh, except in uh, Miami and parts of Los Angeles and parts of New York City. Um, I think he would ask what right any teacher, school board, or politician has to deprive any child in America the right to learn to read, write, and speak the language of this nation, the language of all nations, uh, clearly and fluently. Uh, I think if, if teachers and school boards truly respected, truly loved uh, their students, they would double their efforts to teach every child in this nation, regardless of that child's origins. They would teach every child English as a first language, not as a second language, for it is the first language of our nation and of the world. It is the only language to teach children anything else is to condemn them to poverty. Noah Webster devoted his life to teaching children how to speak the language of this nation. And there are certain areas of the country now that are doing just the opposite. So open to questions. Yes. I'm Roger Clegg with the Center for Equal Opportunity, and uh, I've read your wonderful book and wanted to uh, praise you here, here for it. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on what you were just discussing, that is, the, the uh, problems that are created by bilingual education. Um, you've just spoken eloquently about the, the costs in human terms uh, for the students who do not learn English, but I was wondering if you could also talk about the political costs uh, that are the inevitable result of uh, a, a balkanized country without a common language. Uh, first of all, thank you for your kind words about my book. Um, yes, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Webster recognized that every language carries its cultural baggage. and. Uh, in, again, in simplest terms, the words democracy, the word democracy does not mean the same thing in China uh, or South America or even in Europe or even in Britain as it means in the American language. The Democratic Republic of <laughs> uh, China or uh, of other nations, that does not, that, that's just not the same word in American, democratic. And for children to grow up with the cultural baggage of their parents' nations, as opposed to the cultural baggage of the American nation, uh, is a disservice to our society because they will not, they cannot learn to govern themselves and exert the individual liberties uh, that we have, uh, that we, we, we take as just basic to our way of life. Uh, the idea of our governing, of, ser of, of public officials being our servants rather than, uh, than our directors, our rulers. Uh, yeah. I wasn't aware that Webster was, uh, had attempted to and apparently was successful in purging some of the religious references. Uh, as you suggested that he did, was he a religious man himself? And uh, what did he see was the, the need to purge any religion from the lexography of the day? Well, uh, he was uh, religious, uh, deeply religious, uh, congregationalist, uh, basically a Puritan, uh, until his uh, uh, mid-30s when uh, evangelism swept across the, uh, uh, the nation. And uh, he more or less uh, experienced a conversion, as it was called, a, a rather akin to born again um, uh, phenomenon in our day. Uh, 
Uh, he believed strongly that the job of schools was to educate uh, children to be Americans, not to be uh, members of a specific religion. And he felt that the uh, overuse in, uh, in previous readers and previous spellers of uh, references to God, to the Bible, uh, that this constant repetition of God, 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 God was in itself a profanity and diminished the value the me of the meaning of the word uh, God and the meanings of all uh, the words of the Bible uh, by this constant repetition. He felt that belonged in church and that the job of schools was to, to educate, to read, and write. Yeah? One more question. What percentage of the schools that during his early days when he was preparing his speller were private schools predominantly run by members of the clergy versus any kind of, quote, public school? Well, the, the, there were no public schools as such. The first public schools, as we know them, were, were founded in the uh, early 1800s in uh, New York State uh, around between 1850 and 1820. Um, but the schools were public in the sense uh, when he was a boy, each state had its own, or each colony, and then each state had its own established church. And people were taxed to support the church of that state, the established church. The established church was uh, uh, required by laws in many states to educate uh, all children of a certain age. The first public school laws in, 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 in the broad sense of the word public uh, was passed in, in Massachusetts, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630, about, uh, I, think it was 20, I think it was 28 actually, only eight years after uh, the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth. And they, uh, the laws required the villages of Mass, communities in Massachusetts of more than 50 people to educate uh, all the children of each community. But the education was primarily geared to uh, reading uh, and writing, uh, reading of the, of the scriptures. Uh, so it was a public education, but it was it was tied to to the church. And you really can't talk about the public education as we know it until uh, the 18 uh, early 1800s. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. There really isn't a direct answer. There, not really. <laughs> the religious schools adopted his speller because they were religious schools at, the, at that point in time. So but his that, idea of they, public... When they agreed to use the speller, uh, that was the beginning of secular education then. Did someone else... Oh, I'm sorry. Kind of hard to see you through the lights. I can stand up if it's easier. I'm Barnaby Zoll, <clears throat> and as uh, some of the people in the room know, I represent uh, a lot of interests in court, and I'm often faced with the, ad with the position that uh, Shirley Bryce Heath, a Berkeley sociologist, and others are making that the founders at the time of the Constitutional Convention were believers in multiculturalism because they rejected the idea of an American language institute and that sort of thing, and I've used Noah Webster as a refutation of that, Madison and some others. I wonder if you have a view on whether the founders other than Webster believed in multilingualism and multiculturalism at the time of the convention, or after? Uh, well, I think you must remember at the time of the convention, these different uh, founding fathers, there certainly was no unity there, and the different founding fathers came, each came from a, a different independent state. And the, the, the primary uh, concern was less multiculturalism than it was the question of, of the rights of each state to remain an independent nation and how, how many of these rights they would cede to a federal government. Uh, this was far more important than uh, culture, multiculturalism because at the time uh, there were, there were few multicultural states in the, in, in the terms that we now uh, use that. Uh, certainly the, the uh, 
the southern states were far from multicultural. Uh, they were, the majority of the population was, uh, was black, and they had no rights. And they weren't going to be given any rights. Uh, the, the, the Patrick Henrys, uh, of, uh, and he didn't even go to the convention, he refused to go to the convention, uh, was that they were seeking to remain exactly as they were. Um, the, I think the, in, in terms of this multicultural thrust, you have to uh, turn to uh, uh, the Northeast um, because there, they were, there was a good deal of encouragement of, of immigration. Uh, there was a good deal of need for immigration to build uh, the, the, the entire trade and uh, local industrial communities. Whereas the South wasn't even thinking in those terms. They were trying to maintain the, uh, the kinds of societies they had already developed. I, I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. Yes, sir. Uh, Tom West's book, uh, Vindicating the Founding, there's a whole chapter on uh, the Founding Fathers' uh, views of multilingualism, multiculturalism. And every single one opposed multilingualism, multilingualism, including the, sub the Southerners like Jefferson and Madison, Hamilton. Uh, there's an entire chapter in his book that's called, uh, uh, I think it's their view of immigrants, but it was a view basically on assimilating immigrants, and they all rejected multilingualism, multiculturalism. It's Tom West's uh, Vindicating the Founders. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you think would have surprised Noel Webster the most if you were able to look at the United States in the year 1999? And what would be his greatest disappointment, and what would be the thing that would make him the happiest? Well, I think the, th the thing that would shock him most Perhaps it was this article by Diane Ravitch, uh, in which she uh, says that uh, cites the New York State Education Department uh, issuing new guidelines for students from English-speaking Caribbean nations who speak or understand a Creole language. Uh, if they score in the bottom 40 percent on an English language test, um, they uh, will be uh, routed into bilingual classes and be taught Creole. Uh, if they had stayed in their own uh, lands in the Caribbean, uh, they would have been instructed solely in English, which is the official language of their nations. And uh, I think he'd be shocked by the computers, but uh, the, he'd be hard put to find a computer that works in Creole or an air controller who gives directions for landing a plane in Creole. Uh, it, it, it's, this type of thing is, is a public condemnation of a whole class of uh, immigrant children to uh, condemnation to, to poverty. Uh, it's, it's just absolutely guaranteeing them lives of poverty because there's no way they can possibly uh, uh, achieve any kind of success in, this, in, in the world. Uh, I was telling... Uh, one of the people here that uh, last week I was at a cafe in Paris and there's an Austrian sitting at the next table doing business with a Japanese and speaking in English and ordering their drinks from a French waiter in English and cementing the business deal in English. Uh, th this is the only way you can survive in this world. It is the international language and uh, the idea that uh, a school board or teachers uh, who claim to love children children would condemn them to poverty is just incredible. Uh, it's, so I think that would be the most shocking uh, uh, thing. The, this apparently apparent drift, although uh, several people have said that maybe the tide is now turning, and uh, we can certainly hope for that. I think the, the most remarkable thing he'd find, though, is the fact that as, as a nation, certainly uh, we still uh, largely do speak English from uh, one corner of the land to the other, and no great country can can boast that linguistic uh, the linguistic unity that we still have. Unfortunately, it tends to be the 
linguistic unity tends to be in the uh, middle and upper economic uh, classes of society, and we are simply ig ignoring uh, the lower classes, uh, the lower economic classes, and uh, this will hurt us eventually. It's hurting us now. It's hurting them, and it's hurting us. Yes? You referred to Webster's Dictionary becoming the official dictionary of the uh, land. Was that simply through common usage, or was there some official action taken that gave it that status? There was official action taken in each of these uh, jurisdictions. Congress voted to make it the official language. At the time, before the Webster's Dictionary, uh, there were loads and loads of different spellings. There was no standardized spelling. Uh, the word choose to select. The word choose could be spelled C-H-E-W-S, C-H-O-O-S-E, C-H-O-O-Z, uh, just untold number. And, and the same uh, writer, as I've seen all, all of Webster's correspondence with Jefferson, with Washington, and the same writer will use different spellings of the same word in the course of one letter. Uh, no rules for capitalization. Uh, he, he created the first standards true standards in the English language. And, uh, and so the, the Congress took a, a formal vote, making it the official dictionary, and all acts had to be written in using Webster's Dictionary. Uh, the different state legislatures did the same. The courts uh, did the same. And of course, schools, uh, this was before the era of school boards, so each school had to do it in, independently. And what uh, made it, uh, what actually cemented it as uh, the official language of in education was the advent of the McGuffey readers. When the McGuffey readers came out, uh, see, Webster uh, eventually published uh, a three-part uh, uh, grammar, a guide to grammar, the spelling book uh, and a grammar book and then a reader. He, his reader was eventually replaced by the McGuffey readers. But the McGuffey uh, brothers selected Webster's dictionary and Webster's spellings to use in their readers. And then that guaranteed that the, the Webster's dictionary would and the spelling book would continue to be used uh, for the rest of the century. The McGuffeys were around the 1840s, 1850s. And they, they more or less ensured uh, the continuing use of the Webster uh, spell and the, sp and the dictionary. And you asked this earlier if the legislatures were for the purpose of commerce. Would you say they were limited to that realm? No, it was for their official, it was just for official business. Uh, commerce just gradually began to use it. I have a question. Yeah. When was the Blueback Speller first published, and was there much change to it over that period of 120, 30, 40, 50 years that it was used? It was uh, first published in uh, 1783 or 4, I think. Um, and uh, he, he himself changed it almost uh, continuously, from uh, sometimes from year to year. Sometimes he'd let two or three years uh, go by. But he continually changed it. Um, and its final form uh, was the result of his work, I think, in 1824, and it pretty much stayed the same from then till the end of the century. What happened was the other two parts, uh, the original name of his uh, speller, <laughs> and it, it wasn't his choice. Uh, the original name was called the Grammatical Institute of the English Language, and uh, that was chosen by Ezra Stiles, president of Yale, uh, who was uh, Webster's mentor and, and friend and, and, and teacher during Webster's senior year. And uh, Stiles was so impressed with this, he, he uh, decided it should have a name similar to John Calvin's uh, Institute, uh, the, his great work on, on Christianity. Uh, so that's why the, this pompous name. But it was, as you may be able to see, this is part one, and it was in uh, designed for the use of English schools in America in three parts. Uh, the grammar, uh, the, the reader was the first to be replaced by other readers, and then the grammar was replaced by more advanced grammars. But the speller, which basically was the alphabet method of spelling, which is still used in Europe and was
was used in America right into the, into the 30s, and this book was still used throughout the South right into the 30s. Uh, the alphabet method, uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, uses uh, uh, sounds uh, for each uh, uh, letter of the alphabet, uh, as in uh, letter B, ba, be, be, bo, bu, bai. <laughs> and you learn the sounds, possible sounds for every letter and every vowel. Um, it has now been replaced by phonics and whole word methods of learning uh, to read and write. Yes? Trying to picture how he got started, and I'm wondering, was he like, say, in his schoolroom teaching his students, and he said, no, we're going to spell choose, C H O O S E, and so they all learn it, and the other people around him, and it just kind of caught on like that? Uh, pretty much so. He kept, no, he, he went away from Newburgh after he had seen. Uh, these differences in languages, and now he was he went to Goshen, New York, and founded a private school. There. And uh, many of these families had come from different parts of the Northeast. They were, in a sense, uh, wealthy refugee uh, families that included uh, the Livingstons and very famous names who had fled from the British uh, British forces occupying New York City and the New New York and New Jersey area. So these, all these kids spoke different uh, dialects of a sort, uh, and they were mixed with some rural kids. Uh, you had one kid saying sparrowgrass for aspar asparagus, uh, chimbley uh, for chimney. They had all these different pronunciations, and uh, the first thing he tried to do was to standardize them and show them how it was spelled. And he realized that the spellings didn't, didn't look, didn't make the word look the way it sounded. And so he gradually, uh, this, this new method uh, evolved. Uh, and he did other things. He was aware, he was very uh, aware of how children learn. Uh, until then, you would have any, uh, lesson two uh, or lesson one uh, of words, you have just single syllable, three letter words. And they would be grouped uh, at random prior to Webster. Webster saw that kids really love rhyming. Uh, and, and he tried to make, make it fun. Uh, so he has uh, a big, he has bag, big, bog, bug. <laughs> uh, he groups words together that makes it more fun for the kids. And, and as a result, makes it easier for them to learn. Uh, here he uses the rhyme, uh, bag, tag, fag, gag, hag, rag. Uh, and throughout here, there are just lots of games. And the kids, at the end of one semester, one summer term, the uh, schools were then, uh, had four quarters a year. The end of the, the first quarter in the end of summertime in Goshen, New York, these kids could all <laughs> read and write, and the parents were absolutely astounded uh, and said, you've got to write a book. So he took, took the next uh, quarter off and, and wrote the first edition of, of this book. It was a miracle. It was uh, something no parents uh, had ever seen before, kids learning that quickly. Thank you for, for joining Thank us uh, today, uh, and I hope that everyone, uh, I know that everyone has enjoyed this very much, and we do have some extra copies of the book available, um, so please feel free to, to uh, chat with us uh, after the, the meeting. Thank you very much. Howard Giles Unger was a foreign news editor at the New York Herald Tribune and a correspondent for The Times in London. John Wiley and Sons publishes his book, Noah Webster, Part of Book TV's look at dictionaries, old and new. This is the Random House.